Good afternoon. I hear the bell ringing, and I want to um, welcome everyone here. And for those who are at the door, please come in, because this is the cooperation SIG, and I'm so happy to be here this afternoon to host it. Okay, so uh, first, let me just uh, welcome everyone here. Um, I know that we've been having a little delay, so uh, this cooperation SIG will start like right now. And I know that you guys are all for the very good spirits about cooperation. Cooperation comes in many different ways. So today in our session, we have a few different things that we want to talk about. And I'm very honored to have the agenda to have a lot of our honorable panelists and also our session keynote here to talk. But before we having all this exciting time, I want to, um, to tell you that with um, my uh, wonderful um, appreciation to our co-chair, uh, Big Kren, who's running at the, uh, who's gonna be um, at this term, finish at this term. So Big Kren here. So we're gonna do an election for our co-chair. With that, I'm gonna pass this to our great um, host, Sunny. He's gonna help us to do the election. Thank you, Sunny. Hello everyone, hope you're enjoying the conference. I'm Sunny from uh, APNIC Secretariat, I'm running the co-chair elections here for the cooperation SIG. So as Joy mentioned, uh, Bikram's term finishes at this conference, that means after this conference, not right here, after this session. Uh, we have put out the call for nominations, we sent to cooperation SIG and APNIC talk, this is as per the SIG guidelines. Um, on 15th of January, and the nominations were closed on the, this Sunday, 16th of February at um, Brisbane time, 23.50. The term of uh, this co-chair is two years. The co-chair responsibilities are the part of the SIG guidelines. You know, they basically have to assist the chair and also step into the chair's position if the chair is unable to conduct the SIG session. Um, and they must remain subscribed to the mailing list of the SIG. Uh, so they can um, uh, form the six sessions agenda, you know, or any comments are, uh, coming from the, through the mailing list, you know, they can respond to them. Um, they must attend at least one meeting out of the two APNIC meetings that we organize a year. And the way we conduct these elections is the candidates must be present in the room. Uh, candidates will, give, will be given two minutes opportunity to speak to the participants. And the voting is by those who are present in the room, excluding APNIC staff and RAR staff. The election is decided by count of show of hands, so when, we, when I call for show of hands, please raise high so we can take a count. Um, the count is taken by APNIC secretariat staff, so my colleagues in the room will help me out. The candidate with the larger number of counts will be declared as elected co-chair of this SIG. Hope this is clear for everyone. Thank you. So, we received two nominations. We have only one position. Um, the first one we received is the current co-chair, Bikram Shrestha, and the second one is from Brownwin Mercer. So I give two minutes to each of the candidates to come forward and uh, uh, speak to the participants. Um, so I'll invite Bikram Strater first. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sunny. My name is Bikram Strater. I am from uh, developing country Nepal. Currently, I am serving as a president uh, of Nepal Internet Foundation, co-chair of Nepal IGF, and co-chair of Corporation SIC. And also, I am involving in Internet Society from last uh, 2007. And I have uh, every role, member, treasurer, secretary, uh, Vice President, Senior Vice President, and 
President, now I am past president of Internet Society, Nepal chapter. I'm also involved in uh, IT Cert NB as a treasurer, and I'm professionally working in bank as a head digital banking. My basic responsibility uh, in banking is uh, to handle all over uh, administrative project business uh, related with the uh, card business, with MasterCard, Visa card, and other card, with internet banking, mobile banking, and so on. I have been uh, closely working with various national, mm -hmm. regional, uh, and global organizations, including uh, JCI Nepal, uh, IT Cert, NP, NP NOC, Nepal, uh, uh, Nepal uh, Can, Inter uh, Can Found uh, Federation, uh, as well as ISOC, APRALU, uh, ICANN, APSIC, APRIIZF, APRICODE, and IGF at regional and global level. My ex experience comes from working with different stakeholders, including the private sector, the government, civil society, international uh, organization, and academia, who will be uh, added advantage to bring SIG in new high. I believe uh, this uh, SIG will uh, help me to uh, grow more in this area, and I'm elected. If I'm elected as a co-chair again, I uh, I will bring a unique perspective from a local and global uh, enhancing corporation SIG diversity for all aspect and regional uh, perspective. I also try my best to improve its uh, visibility into the challenge facing the million internet users of SI Pacific from different aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram, and good luck. And next, I invite uh, Brownwin Mercer, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here and giving me the opportunity to run as co-chair. Um, thank you, Bikram, for your, um, for your statement as well, um, and all the best. Um, as By way of introduction, my name is Bronwyn Mercer. I'm a information security professional working in the financial services industry in Sydney, Australia. Um, while I've been working in um, the cybersecurity space for around seven years, I'm much newer to the internet governance space, having started out at, as a fellow at the 2017 um, Geneva IGF, and since then have gone on to um, participate in a few different fellowships, such as the ICANN 64 Fellowship, um, and now I have a position as a um, steering committee member on the Australian IGF. So I'm also involved um, as a committee member for Youth for IG, an initiative which aims to increase youth participation in internet governance in the Asia Pacific region. So I'm really passionate about diversity and I think that's key to the multi-stakeholder model is getting all the different stakeholders in, at, at the table and, and hearing their different perspectives so that we can create policies which are mutually beneficial for everyone. So I think that as part of um, perhaps running as the at, for this position as co-chair um, of the cooperation SIG, um, perhaps I don't have many years of internet governance experience or um, or even professional experience, but I hope that I can bring a unique perspective um, into this into this forum and as a technical stakeholder and also someone who's passionate about um, understanding other people's perspectives. I hope that. I can help facilitate connections and discussions between different stakeholders within um, the Asia Pacific region and even beyond um, and help, help all of us to move forward in, um, in creating policy which, um, which helps both the technical and, and the policy and diplomatic communities um, to, create, um, to create better outcomes um, going forward into the future. So, um, so really, um, I'm just here to offer, offer myself and um, avail myself to help, um, help the community and help you to, um, to have beneficial discussions. And um, yeah, I, I put my time out there and, and put, I really put myself out there um, to help you and um, hope that 
yeah, hope, hope that um, we can have great discussions going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Bronwyn, and uh, good luck as well. So, um, going back to a slide. As I said earlier, um, the voting is by those who are present in the room, excluding APNIC staff and uh, RIR staff. So I'll call for um, um, those who are in support for Bikram, Bikram Shrestha. Please raise your hand. Um, George. Sorry, did you? <laughs> We're almost done. Thank you. Um, now, those who are in support of uh, Brownwin Mercer for the co-chair of uh, Cooperation SIG, please raise your hand. Thank you. I'll just tally up with my colleague. Thank you, Odagi. Um, I declare Bikram Shrestha as the elected co-chair of Cooperation SIG. Thank you. Where is Joy? Joy, over to you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Sonny, for running a very smooth election, and thank you, uh, Bikram, for continuing to be my partner as a co-chair, and I want to also give my thanks to Bronny to participate in this, because you definitely, every one of you, will bring the different values to this special interest group, and I'm sure that as we go along, that we're going to see the different uh, perspective from the very diversified community, and uh, that's really why we have this cooperation special interest group. So um, to come back to our agenda, that we are, um, <clears throat> last year in Chiang Mai, we introduced and talked about internet jurisdiction. Now, it's a very complicated topic, but we try to use a very um, simple way to having people understand and going forward. So last year we talked about what internet jurisdiction is. We have people talk about cybersecurity incidents that brought up the cross border. We also have professors from university to talk about because internet is everywhere, it's being taken in every aspect of it, transaction based of applications or even static, that where we see a lot of the vulnerabilities or um, phishing, even if you're just browsing. So um, with that, we have the professor talking about the morale of you know, how to use the internet. So that's kind of like a good thing to having the next generation when they start using the internet, they know more than just the technology side of it. So this year, we are going to be focusing on the cybersecurity incidents and the cyber norm, because recently that we have been exposed a lot of the different aspects about the cyber norm. The norm is interesting because before we come to the law and regulations, the norm is somehow in between with good practice and what's the best to serving the community. So um, last year, um, in Berlin in November, we have people coming to um, the, the UN, the IGF, talking about the norms, the cyber norms. So this year, I want to use the session to having uh, Nicole, who has been practicing law 
and then she was a government officer in the in the cabinet, and now she's back into the private practice, and she's gonna give us like a a, a keynote on the cyber norm, the evolution of it, and after that, I was very honored to have seven uh, five speakers as my panelists, as you see the chairs here. So that we will be having a very productive dialogue, talking about the cyber norm. How can we utilize those to really to avoid some of maybe the cyber security incident conflicts in the later? So with all this agenda, and since we have been a little delayed for today's talk, I think we're going to be uh, trying to do this in a very effective way. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my keynote, Nicole, to please come up to the stage. Nicole is attorney-in-law. She's now in the, um, the vice chairperson for the Digital Transformation Association, and also she's um, an industrial uh, consultant. So she's going to be giving us a presentation as a speaker, talking about the cyber norm and the evolution. So without further ado, Nicole. Thank you, Joy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to be here again, yeah, Corporate SIG. And uh, uh, this afternoon, after the election, I would like to give a brief uh, introduction about the uh, cyber norm. Uh, as I'm not uh, people from a uh, technical background, uh, but I have worked with uh, technology people for a long time, so you can see me in the middle, <laughs> the technical side and the uh, maybe law enforcement side, and uh, as I was the former um, regulator in Taiwan, so I know what the government officers' uh, thoughts. Uh, so uh, today my topic is uh, the uh, cyber norm uh, evolution. <clears throat> okay, so next page. Oops. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So uh, maybe we should start as uh, what is norm. As we may know that the norm is an accepted standard or a way of behavior or doing things that most people agree with. Or we can say norm is a situation or type of behavior that is expected and considered to be typical. So we can say that norm indicates the shared expectations of appropriate behavior. But how about the cyber norm? Cyberspace has created both great opportunities for and serious threats to our society. As we use internet in our normal life, just as water and electricity, this has led to a common understanding that cyber activities and behaviors pertaining to the use of information and communication technology that we call it ICTs has to be limited in order to prevent conflicts that endanger international peace and security. <clears throat> Recent discussion in international forum occasions and even practices indicate cyber norms as the most suitable vehicles for guiding behavior in cyberspace. We are all familiar with the internet governance models, which are including multi-stakeholder model and cyber sovereignty model. In multiple stakeholder model, the development and application by governments, the private sectors and the civil society together in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evo <coughs> evolution and the use of the internet. But in the cyber sovereignty model, a state creates boundaries on a network and then exerts a form of control, often in the form of law enforcement, over such boundaries. One way of looking at cyber norms for responsible behavior is to see them as the tools to deal with the uncertainties ingrained in the fact that the internet now un underpins our societies, economies, vital infrastructures, and even political events such as elections. This uncertainty can result from the unpredictability of behavior, but it can also be traced 
to the impact of technology developments and or business models on and under prepared organizations and individuals and a persistent lack of in, uh, reliable data on the threats and the risk to our digital societies. So let's see the uh, cyber norm uh, involving process. We can see the shift of the development of cyber norm from emergence to cascade then to entrenchment. Let's see the traditional case of uh, how norms uh, shapes the environment. Let's see the US uh, uh, car seat belt. In 1968, National Highway Safety Bureau requires seat belt fastening. fastening. Battles over, uh, battles uh, over regulation and the civil liberties infringements. Research supporting the number of lives seat belts could save. From 1983 to 1990, usage went from 40% to 50%, and 34 states enact uh, mandatory usage laws. In America, 87% uh, of adults wear seatbelts all the time, despite it being a secondary law in uh, one third of uh, states. Okay, let's move to the, uh, come back to the cyberspace. There are collective action problems. Everyone wants a safer internet, right? But producing a safer internet is costly, and the benefits are dispersed to many, non writable non-excludable. So people do not produce anything for a safer internet and hope others will. But everyone is thinking like this, so a safer internet never gets produced. That is from the uh, ordinary people's point of view. Okay, let's see the uh, challenges with the cyber norm. Challenges with cyber norm emergence. It is the lack of leadership. Norm entrepreneur leadership required. National competition and lack of universally accept norms. Then let's see the challenges with cyber norm uh, cascade. There are um, various actors doing various things online, including national states, criminal groups, uh, terrorist groups, and corporations. Uh, from society behavior and to the economic affairs and the government uh, affair, uh, uh, events, government behaviors. Then let's see the challenges with cyber norm uh, entrenchment. Uh, there is the uh, problem of compliance. Uh, we can see the uh, cyber attribution. Uh, establish establishing attribution for cyber operators is difficult. No simple technical process or automated uh, solution for determining responsibility, uh, we, we, we call it uh, accountability, uh, for cyber operations exists. State secrets and the drill time. So what can we do? We can see the cyber norm spectrum of approaches. Uh, as we are familiar with the uh, multiple stakeholder model, you can see I can, RIRs, IETF, IETF uh, UNGGE, and uh, uh, in the middle, we can see some uh, legislation and some uh, behavior uh, uh, with a limited intervention, uh, some cases. And uh, the right side, uh, as we mentioned above, there is a cyber uh, sovereignty. The great uh, firewall of China uh, Russia uh, sovereign internet law as passed and uh, 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 in act, uh, I think last year, the end of last year, and the censorship and the data mutilation around the world. And <clears throat> we can see um, uh, the cyber known spectrum, yeah, as above. Uh, we all know about the data and its flow are the keys of how internet society and the digital economy work. Here comes the issues of data localization and internet fragmentation. Over 100 countries have some forms of data localization request, 
legislation enacted or proposed. For example, the Vietnam starting uh, 2019, last year, uh, tech companies required to store data on uh, Vietnamese uh, citizens in country. And India starting last year as well, uh, global payments companies requiring low cost storage of data on uh, transactions occurring in India. Also looking into internet companies to store locally generated data on servers in India. And UCMCA is another example. From the other side, there are needs of protection of privacy and personal data. We can see uh, data protection laws on, of the world. I think the most famous one is the GDPR of a uh, EU level, uh, which is uh, um, which was effected. Uh, 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 no, more than one year, I think uh, the May of uh, 2018. And uh, uh, there are, there are uh, private, uh, Privacy Act in uh, California, America. And right now, uh, other states uh, will follow the uh, privacy legislation. In Taiwan, we have Data Protection uh, Act as well. So the International uh, Forum of Norm Diffusion Norm diffusion uh, from international organization, uh, we can see the interna international governmental uh, organization and the non-governmental organization and ad advocacy groups, uh, even the modern uh, virtual forum uh, driven by the uh, technology companies. And uh, there are also so many uh, bilateral agreements uh, that uh, happened uh, all over the world. So, when we discussed, uh, uh, I would like to mention, uh, remind that uh, when we discuss the issue of cyberspace, cyber norms as well, uh, we have to bear human rights concerns in mind always that see the human rights in cyberspace. WSIS Geneva Declaration to build a people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented information society where everyone can create, access, utilize, and share information and knowledge enabling individuals, communities, and people to achieve their full potential in promoting their uh, sustainable development and improving their quality of life, premise, premised on the purposes the, and the principles of the uh, Charter of the uh, UN and uh, respecting fully and upholding the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights. Do we need new digital rights? What is your answer? <laughs> there is no need, uh, 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 from my point of view, there is no need for new human rights, but there is a need for an enhanced understanding of the existing human rights in cyberspace. Multi-stakeholder collaboration procedures uh, will be needed. There is a growing need to enhance cooperation among governments, business side, civil society, and the technical community, especially the uh, big, uh, big uh, technology giant platform, to guarantee human rights in the cyberspace. So, <clears throat> if uncertainty is a central characteristic of digital life, then how can public instruments such as international law, norms, and confidence build measures but also private instruments such as insurance, liability, and the technical standards contribute to reduce and or dealing with uncertainty. We hope to widen the conversation and the communication about cyber norms as using a holistic approach to internet governance. And may we, uh, maybe we can see this issue from different uh, perspectives, uh, those including Cybersecurity, we can see <clears throat> cyber war, cyber crime, cyber ter uh, terrorism, uh, UNGGE, and uh, uh, digital economy. Uh, uh, right now, I think uh, under the G20, the uh, <coughs> financial ministry of, uh, from uh, different countries, they are discussing about the international tax, right? So uh, digital uh, trade, uh, data localization, taxation, uh, uh, there are so many organizations uh, involving in uh, like uh, WTO, OECD, and APEC, and uh, human rights, and as, as I mentioned above. So uh, we have uh, to uh, <clears throat> pay more attention about the freedom of expre 
expression of privacy and the data protection of personal data. <clears throat> and technology, of course, the AI, IoT, 5G, ITU, IET, <clears throat> IETF, and the W3C. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'll move to <clears throat> the next page. The main goals of agreeing on cyber norms are believed to include increased predictability, trust, and stability in the use of ICT. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Accordingly, cyber norms are seen as guiding principles for shaping domestic and foreign policy, as well as a basic for international and public and private partnership. As we are facing, sorry, as we are facing um, sources of uncertainty, ways of dealing with uncertainty, goals of reducing uncertainty, the future outlook probably should be which model will prevail. Thank you for your attention. a very um, thoughtful um, cyber norm. So my panelists, would you please come up to the stage? I think in the interest of the time, I will not introduce individually for now as, the, as what I planned it to do, but while we are sitting here and uh, um, <clears throat> having our dialogue, I'll we'll introduce you as we come. Okay. Well, uh, pick any seat you wish. Okay. So, um, as we, as you have seen, that I have a big panelist here, and uh, I did not expect that we're going to be running short on time. So, I think it's going to be a little invitation, but we're going to have a good discussion here. So, um, I will start addressing some of the questions that I have in mind. I'd be very interesting to hear your thoughts and your point of views. So, my first question will address to actually Suma and uh, America, because they have been participating in the UNIGF. They talk about the different incidents in the past and uh, I think also that they have been dealing with uh, the policy as well as the technical communities. So I'm interested to find out from Suman and America your point of view that how do you see the needs to gap, you know, to bring into the, the gap between the policies makers as well as the technical community with the cyber norm. Uh, what have you seen or learned from the UN um, communities and uh, what are the thoughts and the takeaways that you can share with us? Um, Merike, why don't you start? Thank you very much. So my name is Medica Keo, and I ha started off in the technical community a very long time ago. Um, and I am also Estonian. And it happened that in 2007, I was in Estonia. Um, there was a RIPE NCC meeting that, that was there at the time. And so I have firsthand knowledge of brokering uh, trusted relationships so that the global security operational community also helped with defending successfully against the attacks in Estonia. And since then, I've become much more involved also in global um, uh, policy discussions because they're very, very critical as the internet continues to evolve, as we see organized crime and other malicious activity grow because uh, there are so many complex interjurisdictional issues. And so I very much support all of the work that's going on globally to try and get some cohesion across um, all the countries across the world to have some cohesive norms that everybody will actually agree to. And things, uh, there are certain ones that many member states do think are, are very critical, such as uh, making sure that member states uh, you know, don't, don't support any kind of critical infrastructure attacks that they're um, you know, knowledgeable about making sure also that critical emergency response teams such as the CERTs and the C-CERTs also are not under attack. Because again, when it comes to the, the cyberspace, 
then everything that society relies on, the banking, the, the, the you know, buying things, it all depends on now our, our networks. And so there's a strong recognition of that. Um, I think also that there is much more collaboration going on between the technical communities and the policy communities. We have to say that they don't get it, it's a technical problem, or no, they don't get it, it's a policy problem. The answer is yes, it is all of our problems. And from the policy perspectives, you can't create norms and policy that aren't, don't have reality from a technical or operational perspective. So I know that right now there is much more collaboration going on so that people that are creating policy can understand how does the internet actually work, right? How does routing work? How did the domain name root server uh, uh, function, right? And so what is what are limitations or where is the thinking a little bit wrong, right? Because they see these videos of tubes of the internet, right? Or there is, there is some British skit about the internet, it's a black box, right? So what actually is it? How does it work? What's feasible? What's not feasible? And sometimes things are really misconstrued. So I know that the small country of Estonia, after the attacks, it's also, it also went through a, 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 a kind of thinking of, well, you know, we're a small country. We don't have that many exit points from our infrastructure. So if we were to be cut off, could we s still be sustainable as a society until the issues get fixed, right? And I think some of us that are from smaller countries know that you know, it's not because of malicious activity. Sometimes you just don't have the multiple routes and there's um, you know, some, uh, 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 some unintentional consequences, either because a fiber was cut, you know, a shark ate through it, or who knows what, where you might be cut off from the upstream. And so when countries do tests to see whether or not they're self-sustainable when there's no inter-country connectivity, from a technical perspective, right, you always want to look at the worst case scenario. So testing for such is, I think, a good thing. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna be fracturing the internet, it just means that you want to make sure that if a worst case disaster happens, that you're still okay in terms of all the critical services that, re that rely on the internet. So I guess that's my statement for now. Yes, Suma. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Shona Vesavir, I'm from uh, Bangladesh, I'm from technical community, mostly working for the network infrastructure provider. And also with, uh, was involved with IGF in the, I was in the Mac for IGF for three years and so I got an opportunity to work with both the policy guys and also with the technical community. So uh, what I start from what were very is that uh, now we are seeing a lot of collaboration among the policy guys and the technical guys. And uh, even uh, if I ex bring example of my country, like uh, in this room I can see the uh, Secretary of Mr. Postal Trade Commission sitting here, and the uh, incumbent telco high officials are there. There are journalists from the country, and we take a lot of technical people are there. So now actually we are sitting in the same room, same table, and discussing policy, discussing the technical challenge, where I think we can see the solution, where we can actually really implement the right norms. The norms are designed by the UN and the other bodies, the policy guys, those are, there is a, no point of disagreeing to that. The problem is that how actually we're implementing those and how actually is cascading down to the other different stakeholders where the challenge lies. Like in the IGF, in the norms section, uh, I was uh, giving the example of the Bangladesh Bank Host case that uh, the large chunk of money has been transferred to different countries. And some cases we get very good collaboration from Bangladesh that uh, and from Sri Lanka the money came back very quickly and uh, it's resolved. But in some other places it didn't happen like that. So uh, all the countries are signing the norms. Maybe those who are signing, they are not actually transferring to other respective stakeholders to their countries. Those who are actually dealing with those or those who will be implementing those. Sometimes these are becoming something that is not really technically implementable. Maybe something, a philosophy or ideology should follow, but uh, 
may, may not be directly imp implementable. Some government are trying to resolve something and trying to implement it, it technically, which is not actually technically feasible. And but technical challenge they're trying to solve with policies. So that kind of gap between different stakeholders, different countries, different culture remains. So probably that's why we need to sit in the cooperation league and uh, we need to uh, create an environment where we can all cooperate, the technical community, the policymakers, government, uh, any other stakeholders actually, from the academia, from the law enforcing agencies. So probably we need to think a common problem and try to find a common solution, common goal, then probably we can really implement the norms and find a solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that, um, thank you, Suman and America. You both are coming from very experienced um, background and understanding about how to implement the cyber norm and the, the difficulty of it because the policy maker and, um, and I think many of you sitting in the floor are coming from the very operational or technical background. So I have here on the stage um, Rohana. Rohana is uh, working with the Sri Lanka Search and the Coordination Center as well as Yuka, Yuka's from JP Search. So both of them are technical in the sense that they are from the very technical organization, the Search. When we are dealing with cybersecurity incidents, it's never easy. And very often we could cross the international jurisdiction, um, you know instant conflicts. So I know that uh, Rohana has a lot of the interesting in the promoting the different search, C search um, within the, uh, the ISP, because you, you guys work very closely with the ISP. So perhaps that you can share with us why do you think there's a need and how does the norm can apply? And I'll pass on um, to Yoka later. Perhaps also from the search point of view, what do you see and how do we deal with this cyber security incidents. Can we prevent it? Can we make the response better? Um, are there norms that we can apply so that we can be more productive? Or the other way around, we don't want to hinder that, right? So um, those are my questions to uh, Rahana and Yoka. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joy. I'm Rohana Paliguru, Direct Operations of Sri Lanka CERT. So I was in the security field from 2006, and uh, I have handled both technical side as well as uh, policy side related to our country uh, and related to cyber security. Uh, when you are talking about the cyber norms, uh, I think there is a expected behavior from a particular person, but if he or she is deviating from the expected behavior, then it is not a norm. The most of the cybersecurity matters have arisen because people are not behaving according to the way that they are expected to do. So they are deviating from the normal behavior and they try to harm somebody or try to make a trouble. Uh, for example, in the, as someone said, in the Bangladesh case, they have uh, infiltrated the banking system. That is not a normal behavior. That's where the cooperation is required. Uh, by the good people, because at the moment the bad people are cooperating very well, because they are sharing information among them, and uh, they use that information worldwide uh, in an organized manner to conduct these unexpected things. That means deviating from the norms. But as a security community, we should also cooperate. I think that is the main intention of this forum, cooperation. The word cooperation is very important. So we have identified uh, the cooperation, what is the importance of the cooperation among the security community. So that's why uh, we are part of the APCERT first and many other forums. Uh, through the APCERT, we have a, a strong community and we do a lot of cybersecurity drills and a uh, lot of cooperation on a daily basis. We share the emails if something happened in a particular country. We know that it can happen in other country as well. So we share that information in a timely manner so that we all can uh, avoid that kind of things happening in our countries. Yuka is our secretariat for the EPCERT and uh, there are many other members and uh, we are in the steering committee as well in the EPCERT. So we uh, cooperate with other 
uh, industrial based certs as well and also from the private sector organizations because private public partnerships is also very important as security community we can't uh, go alone only cert can't go alone we need to get the input from the private sector as well uh, and also sri lanka cert is in the policy side sri lanka cert uh, Sri Lanka is part of the Budapest Convention and we have became part of that in 2015 as I guess. Uh, through that one also uh, we are engaging with other countries and we have established a 24 by 7 uh, operating center in, in our country to support the other countries and max to maximize the cooperation for cyber security issues. And uh, there are various other things I need to talk about the support uh, that we get from the uh, ISPs to mitigate cybersecurity incidents in the country. But I will talk that later and I will pass to Yuka uh, for her initial comments. Um, so thank you very much. Um, my name is Yukako, uh, working for JPSR Coordination Center. I'm in the Global Coordination Division, I'm doing the, uh, mostly in, in, in the engagement of, with the um, CSERT in, in, in different countries. So um, you might have actually wondered how a CSERT or CERT could be um, involved in, in, this, in the topic of cyber norms. So maybe I, I should start with the, the engagement of CERT in, in, this, in this context. So, um, I think Merica in the first uh, section mentioned about the, um, the recommendation or agreement from the UNGGE side and there was a um, agreement uh, that, to, that state should not do any harm to uh, emergency response teams. So that's, that's part of us. Like uh, when it comes to incident handling, um, the CSERTs, like, like organizations like us, are the ones who will be uh, responding to the incident in the first line. So, um, yes, that's, that's one of the parts that, that we're uh, also um, involved. Also, um, if you take a look at the other uh, discussions uh, taking place at the GCSC, uh, which is another um, forum of um, discussion at the cyber norm, um, so there was, that was the um, uh, forum uh, made of um, different uh, stakeholders like government, academia, and also industry partners. And um, CERT also was uh, involved in that area as well. So there was a different uh, research advisory group and one of our colleagues was involved as, a, uh, one, as part of that um, uh, research ad ad advisory group uh, from the technical perspective. So, um, when, when you consider about the norms, um, it's not, not about policy or not about uh, bureaucratic process or anything like that. Um, this is also um, uh, um, with the consideration from the technical perspective as well. Um, someone is there to advise on the um, technical um, issues, uh, like shaping the details of uh, when it comes to um, definition of technical terms. Um, someone uh, who have uh, technical knowledge is always, always there to um, so that the, make sure that the quality is uh, and, and also um, the context will be um, in line. So, um, and also um, if you take a look at um, other um, discussions as well. Um, so in, in, in 2018, um, there was a set of um, package of norms uh, that was discussed at the GCSC and there uh, it was um, also included uh, um, about the statement on the vulnerability coordination. So um, developers uh, are responsible for uh, fixing uh, product vulnerability. Um, that was uh, one of the statement. And also I think some of the national certs are involved with the na uh, vulnerability coordination uh, with the vendors um, in the local terms. So in that sense, um, certs, yes, we're also involved in the cyber norm as well. And um, so what I can say about the CERTS cooperation and maybe how, how we are uh, cooperating uh, on this uh, in terms of um, solving incidents in a better way and also maybe preventing um, incidents. Um, I think one of the examples that, that I can share with you is uh, related to AP CERT, which was mentioned by Rohana just right now. So um, yes, in the CERTS community, uh, we have pretty strong uh, cooperation, uh, especially in the Asia Pacific region, we do have uh, AP CERT, which is uh, operating for more than um, 15 years now. Uh, we do have 30 um, CERTs um, joining as an operational member, which are the main, main driver of this organization, and um, national CERTs and leading CERTs um, in the Asia Pacific economies are uh, joining on board to uh, cooperate uh, in, when it comes to incident handling. So um, 
one of the examples of the strong cooperation uh, I, I can share with you uh, is the um, WannaCry, uh, which was widespread um, in three years from now. Um, so when that incident happened, um, we as a third community, uh, we started pretty immediately uh, started sharing information among ourselves. So one team started saying that, oh, okay, in our country, we have seen this kind of uh, infection cases, uh, this, this number of cases have been confirmed, and this sort of uh, industry sector uh, was affected, and then um, someone just posted on, a, on their um, classified mailing list, and then others just replied, okay, oh, in our country there was no infection, um, in my country there was uh, this case, this case, blah, blah, so there was immediately uh, sharing of information, and um, just to know that uh, uh, someone is for example, someone was making any uh, advisory for local uh, constituencies. Um, they're sharing those uh, information as well. Maybe others can also look at it, uh, and then maybe they can make their own advisory for their local constituency as well. So this kind of collaboration was going on. And then um, that was helpful because um, obviously the, this uh, WannaCry incident was like seen everywhere. So. Uh, we do have this kind of collaboration, share information so that the search can cooperate better. And then um, when it comes to uh, further spread or you know, maybe in the worst case, uh, we know where to contact and we know who to talk to and um, you know, because what we're seeing now might be happening in your neighbor country as well. So uh, we do have strong uh, search community uh, in the region. So. Um, please um, rest assured that uh, when you have any uh, anything, um, any problem, any security incidents, uh, you know who you talk to, and, and we're happy to help. Wonderful, thank you, Rohana and Yoka. I myself is coming from TW Search. So within the Search community, with especially the AP Search, we do talk to each other very, very often, and uh, we share many things. But again, I'm going to be thinking that when we are so close together as a technical third community, we do collaborate, we cooperate, we collaborate, we do many things together because we are aligned in these alliances. Are we too close together that we forgot to talk to some of the policymakers or people are not from the technical community? So when we are doing all these norms, uh, this norm is going to be uh, maybe perhaps delay some of the process or um, because different country has different practice. So I know that Bronwyn, you follow the UN activities a lot. You also see many of the things. And uh, um, I know that you are coming from Australia right here. So uh, can you share with us that do you, uh, how do you feel about, are we cl too close? Are we um, not close enough? How do we uh, reach out like to people at the policy level? And uh, how do we do this better so the norms can be practical as we mentioned earlier. We don't want all this policy people making the norms and thinking that they are making the right thing to do, but yet that the community wasn't able to really actually do so in the execution part of it. Yeah, um, thanks Joy. I'm coming from, just for context, I'm coming from the financial sector in Australia, so um, speaking on my own personal capacity, not um, as a representative of my organisation, um, but also from the public sector, so I've previously worked in incident response um, roles both in Australia and Singapore. And I think um, I really like the example that Yuka gave around WannaCry, which was um, one particular example of an attack which um, many organisations, both government and non-government organisations, faced um, back in, I think, 2017. Um, but coming from um, incident response in the public sector, um, particularly in an organisation that is supporting critical infrastructure, just the nature of attacks and the quantity of attacks is, is enormous. And um, I think that in looking at cyber norms and the way that you respond, um, the, the approach is really different depending on the type of attack, the type of organisation, and its exposure. So um, for the CERT community, of course, um, dealing with those kind of widespread attacks like WannaCry, which are very public and visible, um, is, a, is a critical function because there's so many organisations that are reliant on CERTs and they provide uh, such a helpful service. 
Um, but I do think that there's a real distinction between um, the CERT community and perhaps different other kinds of organisations, perhaps financial or government or health, um, which do provide critical services. And um, the environment of critical infrastructure is so complex today that it's not just critical infrastructure provided by one provider. There is a whole supply chain um, that's interconnected. And so a, a cyber attack may come from a, a, like a back door. Um, they won't necessarily be coming um, noisily on the front door, um, like in the case of WannaCry. Um, they may be sort of coming through a, a contract or a managed service provider. Um, and so how something that I'm grappling with in terms of cyber norms is how do we ensure that cyber norms which are subscribed to by a government um, sort of trickle down to the technical community and not even just government agencies and organisations but also their supply chains um, as we get into an environment now where many functions are outsourced. Um, where security is actually a shared responsibility between um, many different um, stakeholders um, in, a, in a complex sort of ICT environment. Um, so I think it is really important that we have these conversations and that many stakeholders are at the table in policy making um, because the way that incident response is done in, in reality in every organisation varies so widely, like even within Australia, um, within the financial sector, within the government sector, um, my organisation may have 30 people in our security team and another government organisation may have one person in the security team who's managing incident response projects. Um, they're also um, the CISO, so they're, do they're doing all the management and talking to the board. Um, so security teams are overloaded and have a lot of responsibilities. So um, I think that just even within countries and in the region, there's such a, a diverse range of experiences, how we're handling attacks, how we respond to incidents, um, that really needs to be considered all those different perspectives in developing norms. Um, and so it's important that technical stakeholders are in, at the table and technical stakeholders from a wide range of um, industries, not just government, um, and also from um, different countries as well because our scale and the way that we deal with cybersecurity incidents can be very different. Um, and I think that we'll get that diverse perspective coming out just from the different people who are here on this panel. Wonderful. Um, this international communication, the, 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 the dialogue to really talk to each other to make the collaboration really effective. And uh, um, I think I'm going to kind of like maybe take a pause and uh, maybe um, see if there's any questions from the floor that you'd like to comment or um, query our panelists. And uh, at the same time, perhaps I will ask uh, Bikram probably can give us like a quick um, summary in a way, but also um, after his summary, I'd like to throw like another question maybe to our panelists on the stage because uh, we have uh, people from the C executive um, suite like Sumim Marrakech and we also have people coming from the very execution level, the operation side of it from the search and uh, like Bronwyn, you working with the financial um, industry. So we see different things. Uh, what do you think, my question is that, the key things, giving one statement that you can encourage ourselves as well as the people from the floor, that we can do this collaboration a lot better, you know, within the technical community as well as the policy. So why don't we, um, if there's nobody on the microphone, I'm gonna see if Bikran, you can give us a quick summary and then we can go around to kind of like do this within time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, uh, I, I, I have some, uh, in perspective of ne Nepali developing country, uh, something is, you know, uh, coordination and collaboration is the most important thing. I, I noticed that even in a developed country, there is there need to be a coordination and a collaboration, and uh, still there is some gap in sharing exchange knowledge between the technical committee and policy committee. Uh, I think there is a uh, gap, and I think uh, this really important in when uh, we are creating uh, norms that all the stakeholders should be involved from the beginning. Uh, this includes the policy, uh, legal, technical, operational aspect uh, must be under understood. 
Uh, there is lots of uh, background work is going on, uh, as we saw in the internet that uh, a group of uh, governmental expert on uh, development in the field of information and technology uh, in the context of uh, international security. Um, and even in Budapest, uh, there is a uh, uh, lots of security uh, conference. And uh, in terms of uh, my uh, developing country, uh, even though uh, there is not a focus kind of security uh, aspects, that's why uh, in, in Nepal also there is lots of incident happening. Just last year also, uh, some uh, NEPs, uh, there's a bank has established one uh, company that's called a NEPs, and network, uh, uh, Nepal uh, payment uh, service industry, and that was also hacked during, you know, uh, because of the lack of uh, some resources and some technical person also not there in, uh, as looking after the security. And the government of Nepal uh, looking after the uh, Nepal Rashtra Bank, the central bank, they has, after that they has introduced, there should be a one dedicated person for looking after the security. So security in terms of in developing country and uh, in developed countries, something different. But uh, the ground reality should be, a, uh, we have to look, uh, look on the uh, ground reality. Thank you. Wonderful developing countries and non-developed countries. I think that we share something similar, but we also have some differentiates from that. So to pick up the brain from my wonderful panelist. Do you want to give a statement or two to tell us that in this cooperation sick, um, share with us that what do you think it's the most uh, valuable things that you will encourage us as well as the others to, um, to really bridging the gaps and uh, making our cooperation better? Okay, from my perspective, the best thing that we can do is increase information sharing. And that means technically in terms of what, what you know, if you had a breach, can you do a write-up in terms of what happened and what mitigation techniques you're putting in place? And somehow also we have to have better information sharing between the technical community, the operational community, and the policy makers so that we understand how do these attacks happen? Right? Because when I look at all of the hype in, in, in the media about big attacks, the one question I always have, what was the root cause? What started it? And there isn't any information about this. And so we really need to get better at understanding how these breaches can happen, even the sophisticated ones, because that way maybe we can be better at creating policy that is effective to deal with the root cause or at the very least put in technical measures to deal with the root cause if it happens to be that 80% of the root causes are the same. So information sharing I think is critical at all levels. Yeah, I would echo the same sentiment around information sharing and particularly in the information, in the um, security incident response community, a lot of that information sharing happens through informal channels so like email distribution groups or even just people to people connections from um, previous relationships between organizations um, or just friendships even so there needs to be channels for people to have those conversations about breaches um, in the public sector perhaps um, they don't want to be able to they don't want to publicize the fact that they've had a breach to a huge network, a huge distribution list um, of people, including, I don't know, other countries who they might not be having the greatest political relationship with at that time. Um, but having informal relationships with trusted parties will allow them to, um, in an informal sense, maybe um, expedite their incident response process um, and make sure that they um, trust the other party to handle that information appropriately. Um, so I already talked about the importance of um, community and information sharing, so I would not repeat, but uh, if I can maybe add one thing. Um, I think um, in this aspect, um, CERT plays a 
pretty critical role um, in um, promoting cyber norm because I think many of the national search sits within the government or maybe really close to the government, um, which is um, really, you know, which, which are the ones who are making policies and uh, implementing policies, right? So, um, and then in the search position, um, we are the ones who coordinate when it comes to instant solving, so instant handling and solving. So um, with the local um, ISPs and operators, we always you know, continuously cooperate um, in, when uh, we want to um, solve incidents. So uh, we are the ones who are kind of sitting in the middle. Um, we know kind of in a way that the, we, we understand both of the conversations, right, on the policy side and also um, on the um, private sector side, right? So I think in that sense, we, will, we understand that we play a really important role um, in here. And also, um, we are also connected to the international um, community as well through um, AP CERT and FIRST and different um, CERT channels. So um, we are the ones who are uh, kind of responsible for like, um, looking at, looking into the international situation as well, but also um, taking those into account uh, when it comes to local coordination as well. So I agree with all of you. The information sharing, it is very important. Uh, at the same time, the policy developers, so when they develop the policies, they should understand the technical aspect as well. Uh, for example, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, there are some people who use various websites for spreading misinformation or wrong information. Uh, when we're having a discussion with the relevant authorities, so one of the policy developers, they said that uh, uh, people, the, the, the domain names, for example, .com domains as well as .lk domains uh, for media sites should be registered under media ministry. Then we said technically it is not uh, possible because uh, there may be a uh, .com site which is not under the control of Sri Lanka. If it is a .lk site, it is under our control. But if it is a .com site or .net site or some other domain, it is not under our control. So how are we going to ask them to register in our country? Even though it may be operating from Sri Lanka, uh, it, is host it may be hosted in outside. So even though they don't register under us, we don't have any control technically. So before we take that kind of policy decision, we should check whether it's implementable or not. It is common for security as well. For if we take any kind of, if we implement any kind of uh, policy development related to cyber security, then it should be implementable. So otherwise, no point. The technical, the policy developers should understand the uh, poli uh, technical aspect as well. Uh, at the same time, uh, if you take a particular sector, the issues are very common. If you take telcos, uh, ISPs, uh, they have common issues. Uh, in Sri Lanka, what we have, the, the strategy is to build sector-based uh, security communities, sector-based sets. So if a particular incident happened to one ISP, so it can happen to the other ISP as well. But if they share the information among that community only, so they don't need to disclose their identity to the external world. If they can share the information within the community, then they can protect themselves as well as the community, because most of the time, all the people are using their resources for their uh, internet access or any other network related access uh, requirements. So that kind of uh, structure should be there in the, in the country so that it will be easy to have a proper cooperation as well as collaboration uh, among the uh, various kind of stakeholders. Uh, echoing with uh, the need for more data sharing, and also we can take Start is an example that uh, how to collaborate with uh, different stakeholders. Government should also think about more collaborating. Different stakeholders should think of more collaborating. And one basic thing, actually, government should decide that uh, if I go from the last slide of the presentation, initial presentation, that uh, should we go to the multi-stakeholder model or it's a kind of nationalistic model we, we, we segment the internet. And that fear, the technical committee thought about 20 years before, what we've learned from the David Conrad speech in the opening session. So where I think uh, we need more engagement with the government and what best, how we should move. So again, it comes to collaboration, cooperation, information sharing, and building trust among all the stakeholders, all the states. That's how we can actually we can solve this problem. Thank you. Information sharing, I 
hearing this coming to us. So with that, I'm gonna close our session and thank you for my wonderful panelists. I know that we have great performance waiting for us at the town hall. So uh, thank you very much for participating in our cooperation SIG and I wish you all have a wonderful day and uh, conference here. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.